We want to have a discussion now that's a little more about our two key challenges. We've heard a lot of sort of uh, opening remarks, general remarks, political remarks, and so on, but we want to focus on buildings for the first part of this little discussion among uh, the four of you, and then on transportation for the second part. So for buildings, there seems to be a couple of ways to slice up the problem. Uh, one is to differentiate between what needs to be done to retrofit existing buildings versus what needs to be done to assure that new buildings, as you refer to James and others, do not emit GHGs. Uh, another way is to look at the enablers of change to how buildings are, are built and operated. And I would suggest that sufficient education resources are the key to getting enough professional and trades people trained. And then uh, having enough trained people is key to get the work done. The other key enabler is finances, of course, it always is. How do we make available the required capital to retrofit existing buildings? And how do we assure that building new buildings that are zero emitters makes financial sense? Is there a role for local improvement? charges and other kinds of financial incentives and so on. So uh, maybe Councillor Morley can kick us off from the, the building side of this conversation and you can have a chat with each other about how to cooperate across governments and so sure. on. Sure. So uh, thanks for the question, Brian, and I agree it's an important uh, place for us to be working and the City of Toronto has been a leader, I'd love to say, in uh, this area um, in developing the Toronto Green Standards. Uh, for all new buildings that come in for uh, development in the city of Toronto. So as part of that um, policy document, uh, all new developments are subject to it uh, as they go through their um, initial application submissions and even pre-application submissions. Um, they get the opportunity to sit with our planning department uh, who works with them through um, you know comprehensive uh, guides around what Toronto Green Standards looks like. House then is a regular uh, feature at our IEC committees and really does provide incredible insights and guidance to us as members of committee uh, and as counselors and probably knows the document inside <laughs> better than I do. Uh, but that is one of the ways um, that the City of Toronto is really working to ensure that all new buildings that are coming online, and you are right, Brian, we have more development in the City of Toronto than the top four uh, North American cities. Um, and so there's at least 200 cranes in the sky every day. and we all see, you know, the real dramatic nature of our growing, evolving city. Um, and so we're certainly trying to do our part as a city of Toronto to provide guidance um, to builders, to developers on how to get the right mix of materials. Um, in addition to the green standards uh, piece, something that we also look at are things like, we just talked about it this week at IBC, um, is um, bird migration, for example, right? When we talk about our climate, our crisis, and the urgency around it, a big and important part is that we remember that we are all part of a larger, larger ecosystem. And it doesn't revolve around us. <laughs> we need to be better stewards of it and better understand it. And the city of Toronto is actually on two very important flight paths um, for migrating birds. And so when we have buildings that are keeping their lights on all night, um, not only is that bad for burning you know, energy unnecessarily, it also is the second um, biggest um, danger to migrating birds. Um, thousands and thousands are killed uh, in our city. And so these are the kinds of ways in which we are governing and trying to provide guidance and ensuring that um, we're doing better as it relates to green standards for our buildings. Sure, I'm happy to chime in. You, you talked about finances and, and that's a critical piece, not only in buildings, but on climate change policies across the board. I mean, you talked about the Trans Mountain Pipeline. One of the th one of the things I see over and over again at our level, and it applies to municipalities, is you need policy certainty. Because if you want the private sector to invest their money in a way that's going to help us achieve the goals that we all want, you need policy certainty. And when you have when you don't have that, when you have when all parties aren't you know, even in the same chapter level on the same page. You've got the private sector sort of keeping their money in their pockets. They say, well, I'm not going to spend that money if I don't have to. And you, you see it in, you know, when it comes to home building or building new buildings here or retrofits. 
I, I was back when I was chairing the resource committee again. We were talking about net zero buildings. We had, I don't know if I knew this guy was, but he was in the building industry. He GTA and he came in and he said, it cost $30,000 per house more to make a net zero. I thought, that sounds crazy. So I sent a text to a friend of mine who's a home builder. I won't tell you the words he used in responding, but he's saying, this guy's not telling me. He's not being completely honest with me. Because the price of a piece of wood and the price of a brick is the same uh, cost in Toronto as it is in Kingston. So it's, it's all about profit. For them. So if you don't have policy consistency, and if I'm, if I'm going to build new houses over on Neil or Crescent, and I'm thinking, well, geez, this next guy might be in power two months from now, and he's going to make it you know, cheaper for me to do it, I'm going to hold back. So that you know, so we need we need financial certainty, and that's why it's so important that we put the politics aside and get on the same page on this issue. Because otherwise, we have this ebb and flow and up and down, and things don't, don't get done the way they're supposed to. And here in Toronto, I'm sorry, I keep getting me to my hand over We can't both get Yeah, he knows that he's out of there. But we but we need to work together. We need to work across party lines, and we need to work. You know. But federally, we're not, we don't have any, do it again. We don't have responsibility for, you know, the buildings in, in Etobicoke or whatnot. But what we do have is the ability to take a leadership role and work with the other little uh, government. We have a program that we announced a year ago, which is now starting to be rolled out called the Housing Accelerator Fund. And we're working with municipalities directly to try to get them to do two things. Build new homes faster to eliminate some of the you know, usual things that we hear about the slow things done, but to do it efficiently and, you know, more uh, uh, climate friendly. So that's a role we can play, and, and there's a number of other things, but I'll, I'll pass it on that. Thanks. Sure. I mean, I think, I think um, I'll try to add uh, a little bit to, to what James was saying. I think, you know, on specifically on buildings, I think one of the things we have done mainly it's more for homes really is you know offer uh, financial incentives for folks or, or subsidies five up to five thousand dollars for people to retrofit their homes for example right so there's certain things that we the federal government's been doing to try to help folks who want to make that transition um, in their home uh, make that transition um, the second thing i'll point to is something i alluded to earlier which is you know the role we're playing along with provinces in trying to make sure our electricity generation is cleaner that our electricity grid and moves to net zero um, and I think, you know, that's very important because a lot of the energy that goes into those buildings is electricity. And, uh, and so frankly, we need to, if we're going to address that, that issue that you were to grind the outset, then we've got to do that. Um, so that's the second piece where, where I would say the federal government's playing a role. Um, and the last thing I will say is, is, you know, I think, I think carbon pricing is critical. Like I talked, spoke earlier about how it's, uh, the federal government projects that it's going to be responsible for about a third of uh, a third of the reduction in emissions that we need to hit our targets. Um, so that's that's significant. Uh, probably the single biggest policy measure in terms of reducing reducing emissions and meeting those targets. And and the, and the main, I don't in this room I probably don't have to explain this, but you know for me carbon pricing is about saying look there's a cost of polluting, there's a cost to our health, there's a cost to the economy, there's a cost to our children, there's you know in many different ways. And so, um, and so we need to make sure that we're reflecting that cost when we pollute. And, and the goal here is for us collectively, whether it's as individuals or as businesses, to not just change our behaviors, but also to innovate, do some of the things that, you know, James and Morley and others have been talking about. And so, you know, part of this is, you know, yes, there's a work we're doing on the electricity grid, but I think when it comes to buildings and frankly, any other, other form of, of emission, I mean, the goal here is, is to, set that carbon price at a level that ensures that we're all innovating in the way we need to, adjusting our behaviors in the way we need to, and doing all that things we need to to make sure. So that includes, to me, that includes the energy, the emissions that come out of the, uh, out of our buildings as well. Yeah, I just wanted a couple things on the building front. Um, the Toronto Green Standard is really good um, for the city, um, and that is for new buildings. So to give you an idea as to how Frail that can be. We almost lost it early last year, so earlier this year. Yeah, earlier this year, when the when the provincial government uh, announced Bill Twenty Three, 
which would have eliminated the legal process, which would have given Toronto the ability to even have a Toronto Green Standard for new buildings. Now, the problem is even that has smoothed that out a little bit. It seems like we're moving forward. It was an unintended consequence, they say, so thankfully the Toronto Green Standard still stands. But it gives you an idea of how important each of these levels, different levels of government are, because each level of government has different responsibilities under the Constitution. So in Toronto, we do have the capacity, because of that, because of provincial powers, to regulate new buildings. The old buildings, we also have the power to do that as well. But the technical issue of the old buildings is a much more difficult process. It's typically way more expensive to retrofit a building than to retrofit a building green than to, well, not way more expensive, but there are significant costs. And it can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars if you were to do a full retrofit of even an individual house. It's a very significant problem. Thankfully, for things like we, like I was talking about coupons again, it looks as if, I have yet to see like definitive studies, but it looks as if it's possible to just do a heat pump, just do a heat pump exchange to cut yourself off of gas, to cut your building off of the gas for like in the tens of thousands of dollars range. But that's still a lot of money for most people. And so finding good financial situation, you talked about land improvement charges. What a land improvement charge does, it allows you to borrow from, for example, the city of Toronto. And the city can like give you a bunch of cash. And the payback is with the taxes of the building rather than to you. So if you were to sell your house, that payback stays with the house rather than with you. And so, and they have amortization rates of like 20, 25, 30 years. Yeah. So there are solutions, but yeah, you're right. Everything requires money. The city of Toronto has very limited ability to actually raise money. So right now the city of Toronto has a one point, I believe, as of the deal that was announced earlier this week, about a $1.2 billion deficit. And that's a lot of reasons, like for things like transit and stuff like that. We rely way too much on transit users for the municipal budgets and stuff like that. So we can talk about that on the transit level. So I think it's really important for people to recognize how difficult it is for the city to do that and the other levels of government, part of other partners to help that financing. So both from the province and from the federal government that has the capability of actually getting revenue from a rising economy. So Toronto, as a city, most of the money comes from property taxes, but property taxes aren't linked with the income of the house. It's only linked with the value of the house. And I know my mom lives in San Rotoco. She lives by herself. She's retired now. She's not making an income. And having that, there's only so much the city can raise property taxes. But for Toronto, again, it's 20% of the GDP of Canada, 50% of the GDP of Ontario. And all of that income tax, sales tax, all that type of stuff goes to other levels of government, not Toronto. And so that's one of the challenges here in this city is how do we actually get that financing and to what extent can we get our federal and our provincial partners to come and help with those types of costs if they are significant. I think that's kind of what I wanted to say. I have one other question around, I haven't heard the word solar energy yet. I mean, we did talk about the need to increase the grid, the electrical grid, right, for all that we need in the future. And, you know, some of my friends and others here and elsewhere have made their homes with solar panels on their roofs or whatever. And a lot of churches have done that too, actually. And if we can, what's the role, would you say, I mean, is it a high percentage, a low percentage of more incentives to build solar panels on buildings, either new or existing, that would contribute to the increase in the electrical grid? Is that a relevant question? Yeah, I can speak to that briefly if folks want. I think from a technical perspective, one of the most exciting things that are happening, and I just came, I was with some family in Germany earlier this year, 
they have a combination of solar grid and household battery. And so that combination with smart meter technologies allows them to produce almost all of their own electricity, even when the sun isn't shining. Because that battery allows them to, to charge up the solar panel when they're not using it. And then if they run out of power, they pull from the grid, and when they have too much power, either in their battery or the solar panels, they sell back to the grid. <clears throat> it is phenomenal. So there's a little thing, and there's way more of these technologies out there now. They exist. Um, you plug in your car, like I have an EV, and in an emergency, I can run my house with my car. That's how that's how powerful that battery is. Like I can run the refrigerator and you know run apps and all that type of stuff, phones and everything. So the technology is there, but you're right. The challenge are the incentives. The physical incentives, the workforce, we don't have the workforce yet in the numbers that we need. Um, and we have, and people need to, and we need to have the right levels of government to do this, right? So, like, for example, Toronto Hydro, just, uh, just this week at the Interstate Environment Committee, um, was an item trying to get Toronto Hydro to really push forward on just telling people that these are opportunities and, and that these opportunities exist. So, it's, it's a challenge. Welcome to starting. On, on this, it's very, very exciting. I've never been more excited about the technical capabilities for us to actually solve this crisis in the 25 years I've been doing this. Um, but we, we need the right incentives, we need the right uh, partnerships, we need the funding, and we need the workforce. Any other comments for the solar, or should we go on to transportation? I think what we're really talking about is clean energy. Solar is just one example. And the, the, the real the point I'd like to make is we, we need solar, but we need we need a clean energy diversity mix. And here in Ontario, we're actually incredibly lucky because we have one of the cleanest grids. We might have the cleanest grid in North America, actually. Uh, if you don't have it on your phone, I would encourage you to get an app called GridWatch, and you can look up at any time of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can find out exactly where all of our electricity is coming from. And it's a mix, and what you know, I'm, going to make, I'm going to say the word here that a lot of people don't like to hear, but that the word is nuclear. I mean, nuclear power has to be part of the discussion when we're talking about clean energy. Because right now, if I look at my app, I guarantee you that over 50% of the electricity in the province of Ontario is, is, is a result of nuclear power. And if it wasn't for nuclear energy, we wouldn't have got rid of the coal plants in Ontario. Let me bottle an MPP. Thank you for that. Um, and we'd, we'd either be sitting in the dark or we'd be sitting in the smog. And I think, so the, the issue is a broad range of clean energy alternatives. And we saw in 2018, when the province was positioned well, and a number of those initiatives were, were well on their way, they got, you know, stopped in the tracks. Yeah, House Stan Mike wanted to, he shook his hand. I just want a couple of times. Just to like clarify, Ontario does not have the cleanest, in fact, uh, and in 2022, according to Toronto Atmospheric Fund, the grid emissions went up 26%. The cleanest grid in North America are places like Manitoba and Quebec, which is almost 100% hydro. And um, Quebec and, and, and Newfoundland, too. And, but yeah, but Ontario, does, Ontario does have a very clean energy it is grid. That was, that was my point. Yeah, it, it is, is relatively clean. Yeah, absolutely. It is relatively clean, but it's also the province is adding more gas to the system, which just means that the that that the which, which is why I brought up the nuclear example because we've seen this per current provincial government reverse the, the, the good steps that the previous provincial government had taken, including its putting us back on the map. Yeah, but yeah, but well, yeah, this 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 province, this government, this provincial government did cancel the electric, the uh, renewable energy contracts that the previous uh, government had actually signed and all of the regular down coming down the pipe, and that was canceled to a great so yeah, but I just want to say that like it's it is interesting that um, because Canada Ontario does have one of the cleaner grids, but it is just a fact check. It's not the cleanest grid. It's most of places like Manitoba and, and Quebec. And one of the interesting things about Quebec's grid is Quebec's grid, unlike here where the grid maxes out, the electric grid, grid maxes out in the summertime because of the drop in air conditioning. In Quebec, it maxes out in the winter time because of the draw of heating. And so that means that there's excess capability on the Quebec grid that potentially Ontario could buy um, for, and it would be very, very clean electricity, but the province 
It's not good. I would encourage you to go look at the Natural Resource Committee report from 2018 on strategic interties for the very thing you're talking about between Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and the other provinces where we can work with each other and help us make sure we all have a clean grid. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. There's lots to uh, discuss. Um, we're going to switch now to uh, transportation as the second uh, major contributor. Uh, and we could talk about what we think uh, the strategic future should look like, things like 15-minute cities and so on. But I think it's critical that we talk about the more immediate issues, that is, what are the things that we can do to change our existing transportation approaches to reduce greenhouse gases sooner rather than later? So, uh, 